ladies and gents, please welcome back Thomas Segovin and Malcolm McDowell. So put your hands together. Keep clapping, keep clapping. This deserves an extended clap. What it was, what it felt like to watch that film again, to what to watch it anew. Weird. <laughs> How weird was it to watch that with Malcolm McDowell? <laughs> uh, well, it was. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, it's kind of weird, wasn't it? Um, I don't know. It's, um, it's long. <laughs> uh, they don't make movies like that anymore. The, the script would have run like almost four hours the way they had it but that's it was that the era. problem is when you're basically writing the script scene by scene uh, that's a big problem when you really don't have the complete script before you start and you're kind of uh, doing it piecemeal and uh, trying to just get the sequ sequences right you know um, certainly brought it all back but boy um, <laughs> A lot of nudity, eh? Yeah? Of... <laughs> Jesus Christ. We were trying to push. I remember uh, walking around in the end, going back to my dressing room, bollock naked. I thought, what's the point of putting clothes on? <laughs> Just no point at all, you know, across the, across the sort of studio street, you know, and everyone was like, well, everyone's naked. So it was like, it was just that time. You know? We were Fun. trying to pull stills. And I would pull the still, it's like, oh, no, that's a penis. <laughs> <laughs> Loads of penises, yeah. Um, there's some great sequences in it, you know. I, I, um, I, I really don't know what to say. Maybe the audience I, has something. I have something I would like oh, to say. Tell. Yeah, yeah, you say it. When you, I heard you say, oh, this, I, you know, this is a good shot. I like this thing. That, like, the, especially when you're, there's so much footage. I'm sure people here have seen some if not all the old version all of these scenes that had never been used in any form and so the thing that I like that we were able to do that didn't exist in the other version is the acting that you do with your face and with your eyes yeah. and watching when you just would even change your focus and from hardening to softening mm -hmm. um, it, it changed the way that I look at, at many I think other films I'm going to revisit a different way, but so to me that was one of the things about all of this footage was it was the performance that really, so it's hard to ask you about that because you it did is. it, but for me as a viewer I was so, so impressed by the performance that all this footage that's never been seen. And Tom, you, you mentioned in your introduction kind of this treasure trove of, of footage, the original script, everything being scrambled. Can you talk a little bit about finding the film within this huge archive that you that you discovered and kind of following Gore Vidal's original script to reconstruct it? Oh my God. Um, succinctly? I mean, the, the I like that uh, quote that you attributed to Tinto, and it is, was Tinto. He said, if Gore doesn't shut up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, pr I'm, gonna I'm gonna print his script. Print his original script. <laughs> but to be fair, then Gore said if there was any justice in the universe, yeah. Tinto would be a window washer in Venice. Then none of they were horrible to each other. And what it seemed to you be, couldn't, you couldn't, it would bounce off Tinto like. I mean, he, he was, he knew who he was, you know, and. That was, I, 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 it is nice to be able to talk about him, you know, because I haven't really talked about him ever in this whole thing because, you know, it's just overwhelming what happened. But Tinto was really a remarkable guy, you know, and I, I found him a great collaborator and a wonderful guy to work with, and uh, I never had a problem with him at all. I uh, really liked him, and we became real partners in this. Um, you know, it 
we, we were kind of, you were out there, really. I, I remember, and, and also remember that, uh, you know, he didn't really speak great English. So um, a lot of the time, I figured I better just do it, you know. And, and I actually, a lot of the time, I'm doing scenes with a crowd that don't understand English at all. So it was like they were yawning through it, and like, <laughs> oh, my God, oh my God. I remember saying to Helen, fuck this. <laughs> and darling, just cut them out, just cut them out. And I went, yeah, you're right, you're right. She was great, actually, Helen and I, we, we were mates, you know, we were good friends, and I adored her. In fact, I got her involved in this, <laughs> I was doing a, a Pinta play with Olivier, with her and Alan Bates, and I said, I'm going to Rome to do this thing. Listen, will you come and play my wife? They're looking for someone to play my wife. Will you come? She went, oh yes, darling, I didn't mind. Rome, yes, I think I'd like that. <laughs> so, I went, I'll get you loads of money. <laughs> and so I did, I got loads of money um, by saying, I can't do it without her. I want you to, you've got to hire her. This is her price. And she got it. I have the experience of making that did not ruin that friendship. <laughs> yeah, you know, Helen. <laughs> <laughs> Helen and I go back, put it that way, <clears throat> to a lucky man. And a lucky man, Lindy Anderson, I, I said, read this script. I'm going to do the script. Read it. There's a terrific part for you. And she went, oh, darling, I love this script. It's one of the best scripts I've ever read. I went, great. Don't worry about it. Look, you're going to, Lindsay's insisting on auditioning for this part. But I went, don't worry about it. You've got it. So we go in there. There were eight girls reading. She was the last one in. Obviously the best by a mile. And so Lindsay goes, well, what do you think, Mark? And I went, I think Helen Mirren. He went, really? Oh, I don't. <laughs> went, what? What? He goes, no, I like any. And I went, but, but he goes, no, I found Helen was acting it, and this girl was it. And I went, fuck. <laughs> so I had to call Helen and say, Jesus you know, Lindsay's decided to go in another direction. I feel such an idiot. And she went, oh, darling, that's all right. Don't worry about it. Anyway, come to shoot the first sequence. And at the end of the day, Lindsay goes, are you going to tell her or am I? <laughs> in other words, oh, tell her wow. she's fired. I went, yeah. well, don't look at me. If you remember, I went, here, shut up. He goes, oh, let's get the producer. That's what they're for. <laughs> <laughs> and so Helen got the part. Oh, and then he, anyway, she got the part. So that's <laughs> brilliant. And she was, of course, great because she's a great actress and she always was. And in fact, um, I remember taking Tinto to see Helen. She was on in the West End doing a play called Teeth and Smiles. And she was incredible in this thing. And I remember taking him in. I'd seen it, so I left. And I saw him afterwards, Tinto, and he went, oh, she's fantastic. We, we must get her, we must get her. No. Yeah, that's Helen. And it's so nice to see her performance rise up because you've given it, you know, time. And she's really wonderful because it's not acted, is it? It's just beautifully done. And it, you know, that's a really skillful performance she gives. All of those interactions between the two of you mm. aren't aren't in the 1980s. Her choice to lick my face. <laughs> <laughs> I was all for that. <laughs> but what a choice! What a brilliant, brave choice to do that. You know, that's Helen though. She's a brave actress, and. Um, now, now she's playing Golda Meir, you know, which is stunning. She's going to be great. I don't know whether the film's any good, but she'll be amazing. So God bless her. Yeah. And Tom, aside from yeah. the performances, which, you know, you've spoken about, Malcolm's performance, Helen's performance, which are resurrected, 
in this cut. What else surprised you about the process of reconstructing Caligula? What else did you find? Um, I mean, what surprised me was absolutely everything. It was uh, quite often negative, like in terms of, oh, none of this film is where it should be, or wow, there's location audio, that's fantastic. <laughs> oh my God, there's people cursing and hammering in the background. Um, so that, that was a surprise just at, at how much needed to be sorted through. And that took so long. Um, and then the other thing that was, I think, I mean, I, I, I guess I can really just simplify it to the thing that was the biggest surprise was that the more that I got through it and into it, the more that I realized um, just how different it was than anybody had ever thought. And so, I mean, and, you know, to not go into a million things, but like for example, so the voice of Drusilla in here, Teresa Ann Savoy, in the 1980 version, she's overdubbed. Well, this is her real voice. That's the, that's, we were able through the tapes to salvage that performance. So to me, like for anybody here who loves performance, story, anything, um, it's, it is a celebration of art. It is a celebration of creativity. And, you know, not to put everyone on the spot. I hope you liked it. I hope you thought it was interesting and cool. And, um, you know, if you, if you liked it, tell people. Is that how it goes? And then if you don't, just don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good moment to ask the audience, actually. Do we have questions? Um, yeah, so go ahead. You put your hand up first. I've got a million, but I'll ask just one. Um, there's some characters in this version that either not in the original or vastly expanded in this one. So as you're reconstructing, did you find anybody that felt like uh, they dodged a bullet by not being in the first one that didn't want you to do this? Did you have any resistance from anybody associated with the film that didn't want you to, to reconstruct it? Uh, you mean like from a performer? I mean, a, a, a lot of the performers who, who had, especially, you're right, there are a lot of the more character actors that were, maybe you see just for a second in the first one in this, they're greatly expanded. I mean, the thing that is very sad about that is that if they were, you know, in their 50s, 50 years ago, many of them are not with oh, us yeah. any longer. So there were some people in there that were legendary Italian actors that we were greatly able to expand their presence, but, you know, some of them died 20 years ago. But we did, but the, you are correct in spotting that. Like, I, we were super aware of it. I think the person who, <laughs> Helen Mirren and Incitatus are the two people who got the biggest boost because all of those scenes with Incitatus, with the, um, you know, when he's uh, made Consul and things like that, like that was one that... And that's a true story, of course. Yeah, but that was a, a that's a famous scene that people have talked about, yeah. you know, for decades, so yeah. that was exciting to find. Yeah. There was a question right there in the second row. I have a question for Malcolm. When before you went to show up to shoot the movie, you, you know, from just signing on to having read it, talked to the director, was it clear that it was going to be a movie so much about depravity and depicting depravity, or did that look yes. like surprising when yes. you shot it? It is, you know, fairly truthful to Roman times of that period. You know, they were even more decadent. You know, they found a dinosaur in the tundra of Siberia packed it in ice and actually dragged the thing back to Rome and had a feast and ate it. <laughs> the flesh was still edible. That happened in ancient Rome. <laughs> I don't know whether anyone lived to tell the story, but <laughs> can you imagine that? And, and we found that footage. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, I knew it was a very did. risque deal but then hey I mean that that's what it's about being an actor taking risks I mean I knew it would be difficult I didn't realize it would be such a betrayal from Guccione but you know that's that was out of anyone's control um, when Gore Vidal offered me the part I asked him who was going to pay for it and who was producers and he said 
Rock Bob Guccione and I went the pornographer and he went Malcolm just think of him as one of the Warner Brothers <laughs> how wrong was he I mean uh, yeah he was a piece but um, amazing but to see some of the stuff so I, I remember coming up with Caesar said you know and well let's let you know let's do that and and so we just kind of did it but can I point that out as one of the moments where yeah. your face, do you know no, what I mean? Yeah. Like we've seen some of those shots before in the other one, but without all of that set up, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I don't exactly. want to be like a super fan this close to you, but like, yeah, when yeah. I was watching that footage, I was like, people need to see this. Yeah. Well, here we are. Here we are. I think we've got time maybe for one last, well, I'll try to get as many of you in as possible. Let's go to the last well, row over there. <laughs> go ahead. Project a bit. You talk about arranging the soundtrack for this cut? Can I talk about arranging the soundtrack for this cut? Is that? Yeah, you know, that's the question. That? Um, so when they made the original version, they were trying to make it like the 1950s films like Ben-Hur, Cleopatra. They were looking back 30 years. Who asked that question? Mm -hmm. Okay, I just want to look in your directions. Yeah. So they were trying to do, so the reason that the, the 1980 version had all of that really heavy kind of Prokofiev of classical is because they were going for that 50s, I would say, you know, melodrama kind of, but in, again, a 1950s way. And so when we were, we were going to try to use some of that, there was also some music that was commissioned and never used. But amidst all of that, it, tonally, as we started to see such a completely different tone to the performances, and I put up a YouTube video that kind of shows some comparisons, is that there was so much more sensitivity and so much more drama that it, it didn't work with that 50s inspired music in the best possible way. And so the, the composer that I hired is named Troy Sterling Neese, and he's brilliant. And the only criteria that I gave him to start with, was if this movie is released in 1980 and we were going to be cutting edge, you just can't use any instruments from after 1980. But I want you to go as close to that line as you can. And so we talked a lot about Rick Wakeman, we talked a lot about Brian Eno, we talked a lot about Tangerine Dream. And the only uh, disagreements that we had were incredibly humorous which for me telling him push it further. He's like, I'm just so used to telling me not to do that. And the one I remember really, really pushing him the hardest on was the part where Caligula's smashing the heads of the statues. And the thing that he did so well as a composer, and my background is in music, so we were able to, to really discuss like, you need to do this in G sharp minor or things like that. But with, he really watched Malcolm's performance the way I did, and I, needed to give him very little coaching for him to say, so what you're doing in this scene is this, right? I was like, that is exactly right. Um, and so we just tried to make the music echo the psychological landscape, and we also then let it get more atonal and dissonant as the character became that as well. So I don't know if that answers your question. I can talk for a long time, but I'll stop. I would love to listen to you talk for a long time about the experience of reconstructing Caligula. I'm afraid we have to wrap up, but thank you so much to the both of you. Thank 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 you